Hello, I'm Anthony Patton, and I'm going to be reading to you today from a book entitled The Music in George's Head by Suzanne Slade with illustrations by Stacy Enners. And it's the story about the creation of George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, which is one of his major compositions for piano and orchestra. It's probably his most famous work. As I read the story, you'll hear excerpts in the background of the Rhapsody in Blue, the actual music. George heard music all the time, at home, at school, even when he was roller skating down New York's busy streets. George Gershwin always heard music in his head. Sometimes he was so busy listening to the beautiful music in his head, he didn't pay attention to other things, like getting to school on time. It's not that George was a troublemaker, he wasn't. He just couldn't stop thinking about the melody in F. It's a classical tune he had heard at the Penny Arcade. No one really knew George was interested in music until his mother decided the family needed a piano. George's older brother, Ira, took one look at the secondhand instrument and headed to his room. But George ran to the piano, spun the stool down, and lifted the keyboard cover. When he felt those smooth keys underneath his fingers, his face lit up like the lights on Broadway. Without a word, he pounded out a popular ragtime tune. His mother was amazed. She had no idea he'd been practicing on a friend's player piano. George began studying piano with some of the best piano teachers in town. At night, he would sneak into concerts to hear famous pianists play. He pasted pictures of his favorite composers, Liszt, Ornstein, and Busoni into his music scrapbook. When he was 15, George started working at Remix Music Store. He played sheet music that the customers asked to hear. So he would demonstrate the music that they wanted to purchase. George also wrote his own tunes, lively, fun, and different. At age 17, he sold his first piece of music that he had written. Three years later, on a bumpy bus ride, George heard new melodies among the clatter and noise of New York's bustling streets, toes tapping, he plucked out notes for a tune called Swanee. The loud music annoyed his father, but George kept on playing. He just couldn't quit thinking about those city noises. Millions of people bought recordings of Swanee, and soon George was invited to play at every party in town, where he played Bitly Bop, blues tunes all night long. By 1920, everyone knew George Gershwin, the young hit songwriter. People wondered what kind of music the bold, creative composer would write next, but George already knew what he would write, jazz. As a boy, he roller skated to New York's Harlem neighborhood to hear the smooth, syncopated jazz rhythms in clubs and restaurants. Most of the serious musicians thought jazz wasn't music at all. The notes were restless, uh, untamed. The rhythm was wild, unpredictable. 
But the band leader, Paul Whiteman, loved George's wild, restless music. Determined to prove hip musicians like George were playing important music, Whiteman planned a concert, an experiment in modern music. He was sure people would go crazy for this new jazzy razzmatazz. George set out to compose a dazzling, daring piece for the concert, one that showed jazz was exciting, limitless, and free. He scratched his head and paced the floors and scratched and paced some more. He'd barely written a single note when he had to leave town for the opening of his new musical, Sweet Little Devil. The train's steely wheels creaked into motion, rattly bang. Its huge wheels rolled faster and faster, rattly bang, rattly bang. Faster still, the heavy wheels seemed to fly over the metal track, rattly bang, rattly bang, rattly bang. And that's when George heard it. Music, notes, rhythms, slow and steady, fast and furious. The train noises created new melodies in his head. He thought about the old familiar music he loved, classical, ragtime, jazz, and the blues. The different styles of music blended together into one beautiful rhapsody. George heard his concerto. He even saw the notes on paper. Back home, George finished his concerto. It was just as he planned. Daring, razzmatazz, and dazzling. It was a musical kaleidoscope of America's melting pot. Rhapsody in Blue is what it was named. With the concert just one week away, George and the orchestra started practicing. During rehearsal, a clarinet player decided to play a joke on George. At the beginning of the Rhapsody, his clarinet let out a long, whooping wail. All the musicians laughed, but George didn't. He told the clarinet player to wail like that in the concert. And when you hear a performance of the Rhapsody in Blue, that's the very first thing you hear is that wailing clarinet that goes all the way up the scale like a glissando on the piano. A silent, silvery snow decorated the city for the big day, February 12, 1924. Hurried feet pounded staccato beats as people rushed into Aeolian Hall. Every seat was filled, the lights dim. The first of the 26 musical numbers began. Backstage, George listened and waited. He was scheduled to perform his Rhapsody in Blue last on the program. As the band blew, plucked, and strong, the packed hall grew hot and stuffy. Eyelids began to close, people squirmed in their seats, some even stood up and left. Then George sat down at the piano, a clarinet roof fluttered softly like butterfly wings on a morning breeze. George smiled from the piano at the clarinet player. The clarinet wailed as it slid up 18 notes and finally rested on the highest note. Sleepy eyes flew open. Restless listeners sat still. People that were heading for the door hurried back to their seats. Trombones and trumpets blew brassy sounds, soft and small, then big and bright. Velvety violins began to sing. More musicians joined in, each carefully playing 
their sheets of music. Fingers flying over the keyboard, George made those piano keys march, skip, dance. But he didn't have music. He didn't have the sheet music. He played the notes in his head. The room was electrified, energized. People were surprised to hear new melodies mixed with classical, ragtime, jazz, and the blues. George's Rhapsody in Blue was smooth and sultry, brash and bouncy. It turned into an up-tempo march melody. No one had ever heard anything like it except George. He had been hearing beautiful music all his life in his head. And now everyone else would be able to enjoy the beautiful music that George Gershwin heard in his head. In order to hear a complete performance of the Rhapsody in Blue, you have to have an orchestra and you have to have a pianist. It's always a memorable experience to hear this piece, Rhapsody in Blue.